Hello, today we're going to talk about the history of the death penalty, the Eighth Amendment and capital punishment. Um, I encourage you to take notes, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, to start with, the evolution of the death penalty in the United States. So it's not always been the way it is today. Um, in the mid-19th century, the uh, death was automatic in all murder convictions, um, meaning that it was, you know, if you killed somebody, then you were eligible for the death penalty. Didn't mean you received the death penalty, just meant it was an option in all death in all murder cases. Uh, late 19th century, categories of murders were established by many states, and we'll talk about this more when we look at the legal vocab, but uh, California today has first degree murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. There's lots of different types of murder categories. In other words, not all murder is the same. In the early 20th century, juries still had total discretion in sentencing, so it was left in the hands of those people to determine not only the guilt and innocence, but then also what the sentence would be. Um, and then starting in the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement raised awareness of the racial inequalities um, related, to the cap related to capital punishment. Um, and you can see here we have the, um, the scales of justice, Lady Justice here, and what it represents. Um, the scales are balanced because you're balancing the individual individual's rights against the needs of society. Um, it's a woman is theoretically more compassionate. She's blindfolded because uh, justice is supposed to be objective, impartial, doesn't matter who you are, are coming before the courtroom, you should be treated fairly. Um, you can see here that the, um, the scales are balanced, like I said, because you're weighing the evidence. And the sword here, there is going to be punishment at times in our criminal justice system, um, yet it is below the scales uh, where it's depicted, because what happens first is the weighing of the evidence, and then the punishment comes afterwards. So that's a symbol for justice, which again goes back to the civil rights movement here, raising that awareness and the inequalities. Some questions were asked, does it deter crime? Does it stop people from killing other people? Um, you know, does it, if you think to yourself, oh, I won't kill you because I might get the death penalty. So does it deter crime? Are there racial biases? Are there gender biases associated with, uh, with the death penalty? We'll take a look at some information in a moment regarding this. Um, and then finally, is retribution a good basis to use to determine punishment? In other words, should we um, use revenge as the reason for why we want to punish somebody who has committed a crime? So let's look at some data. Um, and just to be clear here, this is um, information that is coming from a website called deathpenaltyinfo.org. I do have the link to it later in the PowerPoint, and I encourage you, if you are curious, to go to this website. So this is the number of people on death row by state as of July 2020. California by far has the most with 724. Wyoming, South Dakota, and, and New Hampshire have one person out of the 2,591 people on death row. Um, the military does have the death penalty. They have four people on death row, as does the federal government with 62 people on death row. So when we look at those racial biases, you can see here that the people on death row of the 2,591, 41% are African American, 42% are white. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, Ms. Cassidy, that's pretty equal, 41 to 42. And yes, those numbers are fairly um, equivalent. However, you also have to take into account the population of the country. Um, as our, as of the most recent census data we have from 2010, there, the United States population, 76% um, of the country is still white, um, yet they only make up 42% of the people on death row, and African Americans make up about 13% of our country's population, yet they are more than three times the number of people on death row represented here. Next, we'll go to the people in terms of the execution. Um, again, since 1976, the, um, the race of the, the defendant being executed, almost 56% are white, 34%, give or take, are African American, 8.5% are Hispanic. Um, Hispanics make up about 18% about of our country's population. I should have mentioned that earlier, sorry. In terms of the race of the victim, um, if you kill someone who is white, then 76% of the people on death row have killed somebody that is white. Yet if you kill someone who's African-American, 15%, um, or if you kill someone who is Hispanic, 7%. So there does appear to be some racial in, um, biases between not only who is um, given the death penalty, who is, who is sentenced to the death penalty, but then also when the juries are thinking about who they're going to execute, they do take into account the race of the victim as well. Next is gender. Of the 1,526 executions there have been since 1976, how many women have been executed? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. How many women do you think have been executed since then? 
Well, the number is 16. There have been 16 women killed or executed rather um, by the death penalty um, in a state somewhere since 1976. So let's just get our bearings here on this chart. This is the date in which the um, person was executed. So the last woman that was executed, sorry, let me get out of that, was 2015. There's their name, their age at the time of their execution, their sex, their gender, obviously all female. What was their ethnicity or race? Here's who they killed, how many people and the gender and ethnicity as well, the state in which it occurred, county, region, the method that was used to execute them. None of them were juvenile. In other words, none of them were under the, were under the age of 18 at the time of their crime. None of them were federal um, prisoners. They were all from a state. Volunteer doesn't mean yes, volunteer. I, I definitely would like to be executed, please. Volunteer means that you have been found guilty, you have been sentenced to the death penalty, and you have voluntarily decided to um, stop the appeals process. You automatically get appeals um, when you are um, sentenced to the death penalty. And then finally, none of them were foreign nationals, all of them were US citizens. So 16 out of 1,526 seems like a fairly low number. Um, and you may be thinking to yourself, well, Miss Cassidy, you know, women just don't commit crimes that lead to the death penalty. And um, I don't know, maybe a little gender stereotyping going on there. Women definitely do commit violent crimes. Um, yet maybe it's the juror members who have a hard time killing someone who is female. I don't know, but 16 seems like a rather low number here. Next, let's move on to Supreme Court cases, Trope versus Dulles, 1958. Um, the court ruled that we must use evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of maturing society to interpret the Eighth Amendment. Um, in other words, punishments that we have used in the past or somewhere in the world, we no longer use. So in the United States today, we don't burn people at the stake. We don't bury them alive. We don't crucify them. Thank God we don't quarter them. That one just sounds thoroughly unpleasant to me. We don't stone people. Um, Instead, we have evolved to get to decide that these are um, these are cool and unusual punishments. So instead, we utilize these five methods somewhere in the country today. Some states have done away with one of these five methods because they have deemed, for example, the, um, the gas chamber, um, the electric chair have been deemed cruel, unusual punishment by th certain states. And they went back to Trope versus Dulles. We must evolve as a society. The next case is uh, Furman versus Georgia in 1972. The court didn't rule on the constitu constitutionality of death as a punishment, but instead looked at the way it was being issued by the by the jury members. And what the court decided was that death penalty was determined to be cruel, unusual punishment because it was wantonly and freakishly imposed by the juries. Um, the wantonly means random. There didn't seem to be any rhyme, and re the rhyme of reason. For example, in one state, you may have killed somebody and gotten the death penalty by a jury. In another state, you may have committed a very similar crime to the other state, and yet instead you get life in prison. So if if this symbol for justice is supposed to be blind and being tra treated fair and equal, it didn't seem to be the case here, um, and that's what the court determined. So what they did is they suspended executions across the country. Um, they granted clemency, in this, in this case commutations, where everyone was removed from death, from death, uh, from death row, and instead received life in prison. And to be clear, nobody was released from prison as a result of this Supreme Court case. Um, it just said that when they were um, when they were sentenced, the way it was being in implemented was wantonly and freakishly imposed. Most states um, created new procedures and reinstated the death penalty, including California. So when I was using the date of 1976 previously, the reason why it was 76 was because from 72 to 76, um, there was no death penalty in our country because of the Furman versus Georgia decision. Next, we're going to get the Gregg versus Georgia decision, and this is 1976. Um, this, this, the court did actually decide the death penalty wasn't inherently unconstitutional. In other words, the court ruled that um, executions are not cruel, unusual punishment according to the Eighth Amendment. It allows uh, limited jury and judge discretion during sentencing. And essentially, pretty much the only reason today you can be executed in our country is first degree murder with special circumstances. First degree murder is premeditated. This is not an accident. You planned it out. You meant to do it. Um, you meant to cause the, the death of somebody. Special circumstances in California essentially means that it is something that makes the crime even worse. And I know you're thinking what's worse than actually killing somebody, but um, you need special circumstances in order to be eligible for the death penalty. 
And by that, special circumstances can include um, killing multiple people. Um, it could be committing another felony in the action of the crime. So you kidnap them and then kill them. Um, the, bird, the killing of a police officer in California is an automatic special circumstance. So in other words, it's what makes the crime even worse um, than just killing somebody. And from here, the Greg versus Georgia case also divided the trial into two courts, guilty and sentencing. Sorry, I don't know why that dog is barking like crazy right now, but I'm not going to pause here. It divided the trial into two parts, guilt and sentencing, with additional info allowed during, this, uh, during the sentencing phase. So first and foremost, uh, a jury is going to determine if you are guilty. If you are deemed guilty, you get a second trial to determine your sentence with the same jury members. And at the sentencing phase, um, the defense and the prosecution can introduce aggravating, uh, and this is going to be the prosecution here, what makes this crime worse? The prosecution is going to want to turn this person into a monster. It is hard to kill a human being. It is easy to kill a monster. So what makes this crime so heinous that this person no longer has the right to life, that we, the state's going to execute them? The defense is going to introduce mitigating circumstances, the background, the character of the info, the um, information is now allowed about the person who has been found guilty. This is information that is not brought into the guilt, um, the, the, the guilt or innocence part of the trial. It's only at the sentencing part of the trial. So the prosecution, again, is going to try to make this person into a monster. The, your defense um, attorneys are going to try to turn you into a human being. So it makes it dif more difficult for the jury to want to execute you. From here, um, we are going to go to Atkins versus Virginia in 2002. And in Atkins, it banned executions of the mentally retarded it, uh, because it doesn't advance the deterrent or retributive pro pro uh, purposes of the death penalty. So, uh, but the court did, however, do, which uh, has been a little frustrating for states today, is they didn't actually determine what it meant to be mentally retarded. Um, a lot of states are using the basis of an IQ of 70 or lower. Um, if you have an IQ of 70 or lower, you're essentially about the second or third grade level. Um, and, you know, I don't think we would execute a second grader. And so if someone has an IQ of 70 who is an adult, then why would you execute them? In other words, they don't truly understand the consequences of what they did. Um, it does not going to deter anybody because, it, again, if you don't really understand what you're doing, executing doesn't really um, advance the, the deterrent or retributive, pro retributive pro purposes. So, um, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Ms. Kessler, somebody can just fake an IQ of 70 or lower. No, no, you cannot fake an IQ of 70 or lower. Um, the quickest and easiest way for me to say you absolutely have an IQ of 70 or above here is because you are in this class. Um, you are in a college prep level class. I can look at your um, your um, your transcripts and you know you are clearly someone who has an IQ of 70 or above. Is it possible for an adult to have a you know a, a highly functioning IQ and be you know um, and then later on in life end up with a 70 or lower? Sure, sure. you're gonna you know you get in a car accident, you hit your head, you definitely it can alter your brain and, and so on. But again, there was medical records, so you can't you cannot fake an IQ of 70 or lower. It's just not possible. I think sometimes we confuse it with um, insanity. Someone's gone insane. Next case is Roper versus Simmons, 2005. Um, this determined that the death penalty for juveniles is uncon Ooh, I have a typo there. I'm so sorry. Unconstitutional under the age of 18 at the time of their crime. I will be posting this in Google Classroom. I will fix that typo there. My apologies. Um, what Roper versus Simmons says is that um, if you commit your if the, if you commit first degree murder under the age of 18, you are not eligible for the death penalty. You can be tried as an adult, um, and that is determined by each state. In California, I believe it's 16. You can be tried as an adult. And you can go to life for prison. You can go to prison for life, but you cannot be executed as of 2005. So, and again, I want to be clear here. It's at the time at which you commit your crime. So, if you commit your crime at 17, yet you don't go to court till you're night, till you're 18 or 19, um, you're still not eligible for the death penalty. It's a time at which you commit your crime. Death penalty um, by state. Um, so in terms of, of which states have the death penalty, there are 25 states out of 50 today that use the death penalty. I and mean, I should also include the federal government here. Um, 22 states do not have the death penalty. And there are three states, California, Oregon, and Pennsylvania, that currently have a moratorium. The governor in California and these other states have um, 
passed an executive order that has said we are pausing our death penalty. So for, so for the 724 people on death row in California, um, they are not going to be executed, at least not anytime soon, under Gavin Newsom. Um, in terms of the number of executions across the country from 76 to uh, 2020, California's only executed 13 in that time span. As a matter of fact, we have not executed anybody since 2006 for various reasons. Um, Texas by far has the most with 570, uh, 99 in Florida, et cetera. You can see the numbers here. The states that don't have numbers, um, they have not, uh, after the um, Greg versus Georgia case, they did not re-implement the death penalty. So they have no executions on their, in their state. Um, number of executions since 76, again, you can see here in a, in a little bit of a different way across the country. Um, in 2020, there's been 14. So the high here was back in 99 with 98 executions across the country. Um, exonerations from death row. So there are definitely people on death row who have been found guilty and have been cleared of any wrongdoing. So they've been exonerated and removed from death row and set free. Florida, I would not commit murder in Florida. Of course, I, well, I should digress and say, I shouldn't, you shouldn't commit murder anywhere. But Florida by far is the worst here. 30 people who were on death row have been found to be innocent, thankfully before they actually were executed. Um, and so they were released. Death penalty today in terms of, um, like I said, the federal government and, the, and 25 states allow for the death penalty. 22 states have abolished it and three, like I said, are on moratorium, including California. Lethal injection is the most common method, but some states still use the firing squad, hanging, uh, gas chamber, and the electric chair for their method. But um, lethal injection is by far the most common. So this map is from 2018. It was the most recent map we could find. So um, this is the states that have banned capital punishments or in what, uh, what particular method that they used. Um, so you can see here that Utah, Mississippi, Oklahoma still use the firing squad. Um, lethal injection pretty much is in every state. Every state that has the um, death penalty does have uh, lethal injection. If a state has more than one method, so for example, Utah has both the firing squad and the lethal injection, who gets to decide? Typically, it's the person being executed who gets to decide the method that they want to use. Um, so, you know, there you have it. There's only a few states, mostly in the southern states, that still use the electric chair, um, and very few states still use the gas chamber. So, there's that. Um, in terms of how we compare to the rest of the world, um, we are one of the only democratic nations. We are the only democratic nation in the world to currently use um, the death penalty. Um, China has, and this is data from 2019, has in terms of the number of people they execute, it's in the thousands. China doesn't actually release their data in terms of how many people are executed per year. Um, the United States, you can see where we are. We are over here. All right, this was from 2019. We had 22 people that were executed. So this is the, um, the list of countries that do execute people and how many they've executed in 2019. Finally, there is a video for you guys. Um, again, this, this uh, PowerPoint is going to be posted in Google Classroom. There's a video to recap this lecture um, if you would like to see it. Um, there's also the website that is linked here, uh, deathpenaltyinfo.org. So I encourage you guys to utilize that. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me or contact your teacher and um, yeah, and ask questions. Thanks for your time.